of this problem. Okay? So let's say, right, I say, oh, this is all abstract math. Silly scientists, they're always off on their abstract math. I want to do, you know, real world engineering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a robot that actually interacts in the world. It's going to solve basic survival problems, because surely when we get down to basic survival and basic interaction with the world, all this mathematical theoretical stuff goes out of the, out of the way, right? Well, it's not quite that simple. So let's, let's try it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to have a robot, right? And this is what it's going to do, right? It's going to be able to do something really, really, that's supposed to be a robot and a wagon. Uh, I make no claims for my artistic abilities. Okay. So it has an arm there. Okay, so the robot, right, is going to do a very basic thing. We're going to make it interact in the world. Now, one of the central requirements, one of the necessary conditions on being an actor in the world is you have to be able to deduce the consequences of your own behavior. If you can't deduce the intended effects of your behavior, you're not an actor. You're just you're like a thermostat. You're just reacting. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to give this robot the ability to deduce the intended effects of its actions, and we're going to give it a very basic problem. We're going to Set it out in the world to find a energy source and then take it somewhere to consume it. So what we're going to do is we're going to set it out in the world to find batteries. And then it has to take the batteries uh, somewhere and drain them of their energy. And that's a very realistic thing. Uh, you do this on a regular basis. You go out and get your batteries every day. It's called food. And you typically don't eat the food where you first encounter it. Very few of you, oh, there it is in the supermarket. You just start grazing, okay? <laughs> we all take it to the nice, safe energy consumption place, okay? So I'm giving this robot a very realistic survival problem, okay? So what I do is here's a wagon, and on it is a nice, juicy battery. Yum, yum, yum. Here's the problem. Unfortunately, on it is also a bomb put there by the anti-robotic lead. They're sort of Luddites who don't think we should build <laughs> robots. Because apparently, according to Hollywood, the first thing robots always do as soon as they get sentience and intelligence is run amok and kill us all. <laughs> don't know why. Okay. So what we do is we, give the, we put this robot in a situation. And the robot does the following. It deduces that if it pulls the wagon, then the battery will come along. Very clean, simple deduction of an intended effect. And so, in fact, it does pull the wagon to pull the battery along. Unfortunately, what also comes along? The bomb. The bomb blows up. That, that, this is to indicate that the, this is like a Bugs Bunny bomb. Uh, my son Spencer is five years old, so I'm going through the cycle where I have to watch endless amounts of Bugs Bunny. So, you know these bombs that are with lit fuses. Okay, so we say, ah, problem here. I see. We have to make the robot, if the robot's going to be an intelligent actor, the robot has to pay attention not only to the intended effects, but also to potential side effects. Okay, so what we need to do is make the robot not only to deduce intended effects, but potential side effects. Okay, we think this is a great test situation, so we build our improved robot. See, the brain's bigger. <laughs> okay. okay, we put it into the same situation. Here's the wagon. Wheels, bomb, sorry, battery and bomb. Oops, sorry, I guess I should have a witch on that. Okay. And now this robot, we put it into this situation, and it goes up to this wagon, and it just sits there, and it seems to be calculating and calculating and calculating and calculating, and then the bomb goes off. <laughs> the robot's destroyed. And we go, okay, well, what's going on here? And now this time we were clever. Right, we have sort of a black box device so we can sort of look inside the robot and see what's going on. And what we see the robot doing is it's actually calculating the intended effect, the battery comes along, and all kinds of potential side effects, like that the left wheel will turn at least one centimeter, at least two centimeters, at least three centimeters. So will the right wheel. There'll be some squeaking noises. The overall reflectance patterns coming off the, uh, off the wagon will change slightly. The grass will be indented. Probably not have any effect on the overflying airplane. <laughs> now, what's the, what's the problem here? What's the potential number of side effects it has to check? It approaches <coughs> infinity. Oh, that's not good. 
You don't want infinity anywhere in your cognitive processing because it'll screw you up. Okay? So we say, oh, well, that's a problem. Okay, what we need to do, right, is we need to make a robot that can somehow determine if an effect, whether it's an intended effect or side effect, is relevant or not. Now, whether or not we can actually do this is something I might get into later. But let's say, just for the purposes of the thought experiment, that the, the robot has this ability. So now this robot can deduce intended effects, side effects, and determine if they're relevant or not. So we put it into this test situation. I won't redraw it. Just imagine that I was even bigger. Okay. We put it in this situation. We're very confident now. And what happens? It goes up there. Massive amounts of calculation going on. Power being consumed. The bomb goes off. We're upset. We run out of funding. <laughs> so what's, what's going on here? Well, we look inside the black box and we find that in fact the robot has two lists. It's got a list of sort of relevant and irrelevant effects. And it's doing things like, you know, you know, battery comes along, you know, wheels move in squeaky fashion. <laughs> Temperature slightly warmed around the wagon. And how long is this list? Approaching infinity. Approaching infinity. And we realize, wait, this is, we're back to the same issue. Somehow, in order to be an intelligent actor in the world, in order to be intelligent, the robot has to actually intelligently ignore almost all of this information. But we can't just tell it, don't look for side effects, because sometimes side effects are relevant. We can't tell it just to look for the things that are causally close to the intended effects, because many of them are completely irrelevant. Now, this problem, in various fashions, is known at, as the generalized version of the frame problem. Because the idea behind it is somehow you have to put a frame around your cognition and not consider all of this potential information that's available to you. And of course, you satisfied that when you came into this room. You could have spent, and it would have been bizarre, right, all of your attention and your effort looking at each centimeter on the floor tiling and seeing what was different and interesting about it. And that probably would have been the last thing you've done, and it's a very strange form of suicide. <laughs> okay. So, the issue here is that, right, you have to be able to somehow frame your cognition. And how we do this is turning out to be a really, really difficult problem. We know it's difficult because we haven't been able to successfully give it to uh, machines yet. Now, you may think, well, what do you mean by intelligently ignore? Well, let me, let me go over what I mean by that just a little bit more. Right. Part of the problem facing you is you often frame things and sometimes you have to reframe them. And that reframing right, can be very important to you. So many of you have seen this before, and I'll just quickly do it for those of you who haven't. Okay, so this is called the nine dot problem. We study it in psychology, and this is how it is. You have to connect all nine dots with four straight lines. Whenever I start a new line, it has to start from the terminus of the previous line. Now, I can very confidently tell you how this looks when we do this in experiments with subjects, because we've been doing this for about 50 to 60 years. So we've got a lot of robust and reliable data. So what people typically do is they think at first, this is silly, of course I can do this. And they go, one, two, three, four, oh, I missed the center line, how silly. One, two, three, oh. <laughs> one, oh. <laughs> and, oh, oh. Okay. And then, if they don't spontaneously get a solution, right, and you give them one, right, they get really pissed off at you when you do things like that. Because <laughs> what they say, almost without fail, is you, you, you went outside the square. <coughs> now, at any point when I presented the problem to you, did I say square? No. What happened is you framed this as a square, and you understood everything outside of it as what? Irrelevant. You're not going to pay any attention to it. 
The project is to create a closed figure, because I've done connect the dots. When I was a kid, you're supposed to get a giraffe or a sailboat. This isn't a giraffe or a sailboat. <laughs> right? And you bring all of 